When God created the horse, he said to the magnificent creature, I have made thee as no other. Thou shalt fly without any wings and conquer without any sword. So it is written in the Quran. Why horses? It's been in my blood ever since I was born. My mother told me when I was a baby, I only wanted toys that looked like horses. Just always attracted to them. And I used to play at being a horse for much longer than I should have. <laughs> Really, my mother always loved horses just, just for the pure pleasure of riding. And uh, she always wanted to have her own horse and a little stable to ride in. So my father bought one horse. I remember my first horse cost $600. There's something out of a storybook. They're like a fairy tale. And that's exactly how I feel whenever I ride them. They are tolerating us and doing it with such goodwill. It's wonderful. Horses are, are marvelous, marvelous animals. They've been man's companion for we don't know how many thousands of years, but we can't bring them very often into our homes or into our beds as we do our dogs and cats, so they haven't had quite the chance to become domesticated. Uh, but they have certainly learned to be man's helper. We have developed uh, to an extraordinary degree, I think, the courage and the generosity of horses. Uh, we have developed a very high degree of intelligence, although some non-horse people like to disparage uh, horses' intelligence and say, well, the average pig is smarter than the average horse and so forth. That's obviously nonsense, because if you look at the Olympic Games and see the degree uh, of sophistication of the tests that you can teach horses to do, uh, it's obviously untrue. over 8 million horses in America, and perhaps twice that many riders. And of all of them, only a handful or so are chosen each year for our equestrian team. At one time, the Army provided all the competitors. But after World War II, the horse cavalry was dissolved, and the United States equestrian team was formed to represent this country in the Olympics and other international competitions. Today, men and women are chosen for the team by competitive trials. For this sport is among the few in which the sexes compete in total equality. As a child, I always dreamed of riding on the Olympic team. You know, it was just a dream. But I always figure that it's best to have the highest goal possible, and then at least you have the, something to shoot for. Whether you ever make it or not, at least you're headed that direction. It's a great thrill, and I've been um, a member of a, a, a medal team uh, every year since uh, 64 the Olympic Games uh, were what I'm talking about and it's I have great pride in that I think that that's uh, that's wonderful the first time you help the American flag go up the flagpole and you're standing on the victory podium uh, you're gonna cry and you're never gonna get over it getting to the Olympics is a long process of both training and competition but to make the team you must also have an Olympic horse of all the horses in our country only a few dozen are good enough to participate at the highest level the Grand Prix level the Olympic horse must be born with extraordinary intelligence strength and courage he must be skillfully trained and a seasoned competitor developed to this level a horse is very valuable Although a few top riders are lucky enough to own such a horse, others must find a sponsor. Coffee's on the way. Riders must also find a groom they can depend on to prepare their horses and equipment. <sighs> Elise, have you 
WinPlus has been coming up for a while. This elaborate preparation is not just a matter of pride or appearance. Got it? Mm -hmm. It's vital to the safety of both horse and rider. If this equipment should fail at a crucial moment, that could be catastrophic. Why don't you come shine my boots? For good luck. Riders dress in the elegant uniforms of traditional attire. For in the world of riding, tradition matters. It's sticky stuff. It's a way of honoring hundreds of years of equestrian history and continuing a long-established but unwritten code of conduct. Competition goes on all the time. And after many years of advancing through the ranks, these riders have become world-class competitors. They're the best we have. You ready to go up? In the Olympics, they compete in three different equestrian sports. Show jumping, dressage, and three-day eventing. A fourth international equestrian sport, driving, has not yet been included in the games. Show jumping requires competitors to jump a course of fences they've never seen, without stopping, without knocking any down, without falling. To clear some fences, the horse must jump as high as five and a half feet. Other fences, called boxers, are broad. And here, the horse must also stretch forward, extending himself as much as possible. Some fences consist only of wooden rails while others include rails and brush and pools of water. The size and variety of these jumps is intended to test horse and rider to their limits. It's not so much the size of the jump as the way the horse feels underneath you. I have a, a new horse right now, for example, a stallion that I got in, in Europe. And he is, without a doubt, the strongest, most powerful animal I have ever sat on. When I come to a big jump on him, it's like being shot out of a cannon. He just explodes off the ground. And I get up there and can hardly see the ground. I feel like I'm never coming down. So jumping big fences is a thrill just to feel the strength underneath you. <laughs> to challenge even the best horses, Course designers arrange fences in different combinations, full of twists and turns, sometimes grouping them, sometimes spreading them out. Riders must adjust their horses' stride to the spacing of the fences. And in a sport this demanding, things often go wrong. Slipping at the takeoff, crashing through the jump, the horse stopping and throwing the rider, slipping on a turn. Um, if a rider falls off, there's a, a certain risk of getting hurt, but the, the biggest danger is if the horse falls, too. Oh, keep rolling, keep rolling, keep rolling. Keep rolling. Uh, you alright? Ready to get you. Huh? Huh? Alright? Well, get up on your, help him up on your right leg. Yeah, when that anything like that happens, keep rolling. Don't think of anything but get out of the way of the horse. Nothing else. You get a horse that weighs 1,200 pounds, and if that horse falls on you, he breaks things. I mean, I've broke my leg, I've broke my neck, um, and, and like I said, I've, I've played professional sports, and I've never got hurt like I've been hurt in riding. This horse still stiffens and transitions. To be tops in this sport, one has to have a certain amount of natural feel with the horse because it is a, it is a sport where you really have to develop the horse and rider have to become one have to work as a team and uh, I think it's very important to have a lot of natural feel but besides that you have to develop a lot of technical mechanical skills it's it's a lot of work you got to think about their hands when they ask their horse to move forwards As you ask for the horse to go faster, concentrate on the front of the horse. No matter how skillful you become, 
you're always refining your technique. The way you use your hands, your legs, and your seat to communicate with your horse. Among riders, these techniques are called aids. There's a lot going on that you don't see, and that's, that's really what, uh, what we all strive for, is uh, invisible aids. What, what you don't see from the ground uh, means that we've done our job well. We've trained our horse well. It's just like a figure skater. You, you practice all day long to achieve a performance in the ring that's beautiful. The American Invitational. The last chance for North American riders to qualify for the World Cup Finals. And an important selection trial for the USET World Championship team. Grand Prix jumping is a whole different uh, ball, ball game. It's, it's jumping very difficult big jumps five to six feet in height uh, five foot six to seven feet wide oxers big wide jumps 12 to 14 foot water jumps ditches banks uh, judged only on your ability to ride your horse over these jumps cleanly leave the rail up no matter how you look no matter how you you jump you're not judged on your style. If you jump that fence clean, that's all that counts. Now to the action itself. And out on the course here at Tampa Stadium in Tampa, Florida, Katie Monahan. As I enter the ring and start my circle, usually the horse starts to get a little excited, especially if there's a big crowd. So halfway around the circle, I stop him, let him stand for a minute and look around, back him up to tell him to listen to my hands, not to get too excited, and then proceed on the course. Each jump has to be jumped from a different pace and a different balance. The verticals, the horse has to be very steady and collected and back on his hock so that he can jump high and straight up. The oxers, the horse has to be going forward and strong so that he can make the width. So as I approach each jump, I try to adjust the pace and the horse's balance so that he can make it over each fence. And as the course goes on, the horse is usually getting very strong, very excited. The end of the course is always more difficult than the beginning because of the element of excitement in the animal. Now she's coming down over a big spread fence and then into this combination that caused trouble for our other rider. Ooh. That's an interesting combination. Two rails down for Katie Monahan, already having won once this year. For each error a rider makes, penalty points are assessed. The two rails she knocked down have cost Katie Monahan four faults each and her chance to win. Early in the competition, the first few riders tend to underestimate how important it is to approach the double slowly, taking an extra stride in the approach. You'll find that the fastest riders and those that are always jumping the big jumps and going real fast are those that have their their minds have to be working slowly, you know, taking each time to do each little thing right while they're going in a dead run. It's, it's, a, it's a sort of combination, without ever getting rushed, it's, it's a combination that's real tough to develop. Louis Jacobs riding Waterloo. He's the youngest competitor here, 18 years old. 15 jumps, the time allowed, 94 seconds. If he should succeed that, there is a quarter of a fall for every second over. 94 seconds is the time allowed. At 18, young Lewis Jacobs has just graduated from the junior ranks and moved into open competition. This is probably the biggest course and the biggest challenge he has ever faced. No matter what's put in front of you, the jumps, the turns, how fast you go, you've got to keep that 
that rhythm with your horse where you're both working as a team. The scariest is when you lose that rhythm. A rail down. Another one. Oh, oh gosh. Well, Louis Jacobs negotiated almost the entire course there, but he looks a little unhappy as well. He yeah. The essence of show jumping consists of putting the horse on the right spot with the right degree of speed and impulsion to jump the fence cleanly. Big fences are hard to jump even from the right spot. But if the rider misjudges his speed or his takeoff, the horse has no chance. Lewis Jacobs misread this combination, but hopefully learned a valuable lesson. Because audiences never know what's going to happen, show jumping probably has the most audience appeal of any of the equestrian disciplines. And in Europe, it's an extremely popular spectator sport. There, as many as 60,000 people may attend a major show, and millions watch it on TV. In America, however, the sport is just beginning to gain a wider audience. And here, Glendora Kai, ridden by the eldest of our riders, Barney Ward, and he has been a veteran of show jumping for many years. Barney's an interesting story. Three years ago, the spring three years ago, he broke his neck riding a horse. The doctor said, well, you'll get some mobility back, but you'll certainly never ride again. Well, as is the case with so many athletes have a great deal of pride, he's back riding and doing well at that. I can stand out there, and I think just the average person, and you watch a guy come in the ring, and, and you can see that someone that is really aggressive and really wants to win. I mean, like when I walk in the ring, I think it's quite apparent. I mean, every time I walk in, I want to win. I, I hate second. I hate third. Uh, I am not a good loser. as hard as they want, as long as they don't come down. When they come down, once again, that's four faults. They can make all the noise they want, as long as they're clean. It's that triple combination, and now down over the last obstacle. Oh -ho! He kind of snaked over that one, didn't he? So, one of the more compact riders and our senior citizen, at least this evening, Barney Ward, has himself a clean ride. Of the 40 riders at Tampa, only Barney Ward and eight others have completed the first round without faults. This qualifies them for the final round, the jump off. A shorter course with higher fences and sharper angles, where the fastest time wins. It's the climax of the event, where the difference between victory and defeat is often a matter of only hundredths of a second. So far, the only clean ride is a relatively slow, 48.9 seconds. Taking aim at that mark are the last three riders. Michael Matz, Mark Laskin, Melanie Smith. Now on the course, the most stylish of our riders, Michael Matz, aboard Jet Run. At 32, Michael Matz is a veteran of 10 years with the team. His partnership with Jet Run is now almost legendary. Together, they won the individual bronze medal in the last World Championships, the individual gold medal in the last Pan American Games, and in 1981, the coveted World Cup Finals. Michael never seems to hurry, but he is deceptively fast against the clock. Picture perfect. Look at how short, short he cut that. This is the master right here. Matching cuts. Right around the little windmill decoration. Coming down the last three obstacles, being a little conservative there. Sitting very quietly. One more to go. One, two, and three. Beautiful. Oh, and there is clearly our new leader, Michael Matz. I'll tell you what, Michael <laughs> Matz, he is tickled to death. 
And now coming on to the course, Damiraz, written by Mark Laskin. Bear in mind now our time to beat 41.37. Now you see Mark Laskin has been a member of the Canadian equestrian team Mark since Early 1979. Smith in the World Cup standings again from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Mark Laskin is one of the world's most gifted riders. While Michael Matt's elegant performance left a little in reserve, Mark is going all out, cutting the corners just as tightly as he dares. This little guy is clever. Nice tight turn. You can hear the crowds with him. He's going for it. He's going for it, Kim. Steady now. One more. He'll slow him down just a little bit. Listen to the crowd. 40.2. That would put Mark Laskin into first place. Now that's an unofficial time. As soon as we get the official time, we'll give it to you. But right now, we think we have a new leader, Mark Laskin. And as I was talking about Melanie Smith, who's going to be our last rider coming up next, our Canadian visitor really rips one off. Last to ride in the jump off is 33-year-old Melanie Smith. In 1980, she narrowly missed winning the World Cup final on this same horse. But now she really must win here to make the World Championship team. She must go all out. In the ring, it's it's really important to me to, to do as well as I can, but to do as well as I can is to win. <laughs> it's important to win. I love to win. So once I go into the ring, I really determine and really thinking about one thing. If all goes according to form, she'll hold nothing back. If the bars fall, okay, but she's going to go for a really good time. She's going for it, Kim. too much speed into this double jump here. A little conservative yes. there, and then watch her turn. On the time. Takes this at an angle. The last rider. Three more to go. This horse just loves the crowd. He's flying. Hold on, Melanie. Okay. Melanie and Calypso have won and earn themselves a trip to Sweden for the World Cup Finals, as well as virtually ensuring their selection to the World Championship team. Melanie Smith, gosh, what a ride. I mean, the horse, horse is even more generous and gives even more freely of himself in a way than we do, because the average horse turned out in a paddock would never jump one of those three-day fences or one of those stadium jumping fences, I'm sure, for fun. But we say, listen, do this. There is a way around, and I'm sure you can see it. But no, I want you to do the hard way and to see if you can do this thing that might, may be very much at the limits of your ability because I ask you to do it. And when a horse really gives you everything that he has, and again, when audiences can see this happening, in some way, it's just terribly heartwarming. Another ring, a different kind of competition, another style of riding. The final World Dressage Championship Selection Trial, Gladstone, New Jersey. Linda Oliver, a Grand Prix competitor entering the ring on her horse pinchback Lord Peter. In show jumping, so long as you clear the jumps, style doesn't matter. In dressage, style is everything. Dressage is the French word for training. Since its goal is to develop perfect communication between horse and rider, it's the basis for all riding. Dressage competition requires the horse and rider to perform a series of classical figures at different speeds, with precision, with naturalness, with brilliance. Say so not enough bends. Give him a five, though. She recovered after the first couple of steps. Every step, every movement, every transition between movements, however subtle, is judged on a scale of one to ten. 
We are asking the horses to perform to the utmost of their athletic gymnastic ability, yet they must do it as a dancer must perform leaps, making it look easy. So any resistance, be it shaking of the head, opening the mouth, the tongue sticking out, a horse kicking back happens occasionally, or if they get tense and tight, they'll start going crooked, the head will tilt, or the haunches will go one way or another. Um, these resistances or tension will come out. Every horse has a different way of showing it. The movements required of the horse are difficult enough by themselves. But at this level, they're asked to change from one movement to another with grace and fluidity to make perfect transitions. A half pass at the canter. The horse's body is forward with his head bent to the side as he canters sideways, crossing his legs to achieve this diagonal movement. A flying change of lead, another cantering movement. Here the horse travels straight ahead, changing his leading leg every two steps. Another series of flying changes. This time the horse changes his leading leg with every step. The passage, a collected trot with a moment of suspension in it. A very advanced movement. It's flowing, it's forward, it looks effortless, it looks like a ballet on horseback. It looks like the porcelain figurines of a, of a, of a beautiful horse and, a, and a, a beautiful rider combination in motion in life. So when you watch the horses do these things, they're not galloping forward and stopping and turning and running sideways. They're doing it with this particular position of the head, the position of the body, of a, a particular um, balanced movement. Like we say, when you use a metronome, tick, tock, tick, tock, you think bump, 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 bump. You require that tempo along with position. The difficulty, or what takes the most time, is to develop the balance and strength of the horse, that he can do these movements easily. And that, at the end of the test, you have a mark for submission, harmony, lightness, and ease of movement. And that is what takes the time for the horse to develop sufficient concentrated muscle power to be able to sustain that amount. To get brilliance, you have to push them to the limit. Horses are like people. They have off days and on days, and some days they get up and say, I don't feel too well, and I really don't <laughs> feel like giving you my best today. And, and that's where I think it's fascinating, because that's where it's up to me as the rider to try and talk my way into getting him to do what I want. Seven. Good extension. To execute these intricate movements successfully, the rider must refine communication with the horse to the highest degree. It's all based on body language. The rider's hands, legs, and seat. Ever so subtle movements in the application of these aids in thousands of different combinations tell the horse what to do and when and for how long. The aids are practiced endlessly until the horse responds to a gentle squeeze on the reins, a minute shift of weight in the saddle, the slight pressure of a leg, the touch of a heel against the horse's side. That's what riding is all about, a progressive thing of learning to refine your movement so much that to the outward eye you shouldn't see somebody, you know, really moving around and throwing their legs all over and their seat all over. You should learn to sit there and no one should be able to see what you're doing. Sometimes the horse must obey apparently contradictory signals, as in this piaf, where he simultaneously has to go forward by the pressure from the rider's legs, while the rider's hands and seat ask him to remain in place. It's a complex language, a language both horse and rider must master. Well done. It should look like the horse has the initiative, that the rider is just sitting up there and enjoying it. 
Well, it's such a precise sport that I think people watch it. It's so detailed that one little mistake takes points off. You know, in eventing, you jump the fence, and in between, you can make some noise. But here, one step wrong, the score is down. On the corner, if you just bobble slightly, it's like that putt that just misses a little bit. It's got to be absolutely precise. In dressage competition, perfection can never be attained. So riders like Carol Grant aren't really competing against others, but against their own previous achievements. I think that over the years, in dressage, since I started when I was 19, and I'm 38 now, I've become better and better. I don't think I'm half as good as I could be eventually. So it's a sport that I want to reach a real quality aspect about. And I think I can ride successfully till I'm 70 years old. So that gives me a lot more years to get perfect. And there have been a lot of great riders that have won medals at the Olympics in dressage that have been 70 years old. So I'm only halfway to as good as I'd like to be. J. Michael Plum, 42 years old, three-day event competitor, the National Selection Trials at Lexington, Kentucky. I want to be the best three-day event rider in the world. I don't feel that I am. Um, I, I know what's, what's asked of me. Uh, I, I know the, the job. Uh, I haven't quite put it all together. I suppose that I never will but I'm going to keep shooting for that. I think there's a lot of pressure from people watching me. Uh, I bring pressures on myself. I want to be the best. I don't know. The footing looks good. I mean, the ground, it is wet. It is deep. In the equestrian sport of three-day eventing, the rider has to check every fence, every detail of the course. Before the competition itself, the horse will not have seen the course, so the rider's life will depend on this preparation. And the horse will have to trust his rider completely to guide him through situations he would instinctively avoid. The obstacles can be dangerous, setting a series of problems for which each rider must devise an overall strategy. But I mean, I think the first group of horses, or maybe the first 15, it's going to be greasy and on the cross country, and I think so that we're we'll going go to have to... we'll go with what we planned on the cross country. Okay. Michael Plum has been a member of the United States equestrian team since 1959. He's won more medals and trophies than most riders dream of. Hi, Ruth. Thanks, Charlie. 
he doesn't want to even know me this morning. He, he knows. He's been worried for the past two days. He hasn't been eating or drinking. Torrance Watkins, 32 years old, has ridden three times for the United States equestrian team. To bring her riding up to team level, she would train for five hours a night after commuting home to Long Island from her full-time job in New York City. Kim Walness of Connecticut is a housewife with two small children. She's competed twice with the U.S. equestrian team in Europe, but never in a major championship. This would be her first. Some think she's got the best eventing horse in the world. Gray Goose. There you go. It's all right. Jim Wofford, 37, is from a family of noted horsemen. His father was the USET's first president and an Olympic rider himself. Jim has won a place on every team since 1967. Karen Stives, 31 was named 1981 Rider of the Year by the U.S. Combined Training Association. These riders are among the 40 that are about to compete for the final selection of this year's equestrian eventing team. Oh, Marty, do you feel out of it? Get my crop, Pam. I <laughs> Sometimes you start and these things aren't wound and you're in trouble. Time is a critical factor in this sport. To win, it is essential that you maintain the correct pace throughout each phase. Riders are penalized for going too slow or too fast. And that gets me in a minute and 20 seconds early? Yep. No, Jack, you blew it. What? Five's 21. You got 217s on there. Kim Walness husband Jack is writing the key course times on her arm so she can check them constantly against her watch as she rides. I start psyching myself up. Just, yep. just the adrenaline starts flowing, but at the same time I can't get nervous and the legs can't turn to jelly, so I take a few breaths and calm down. Okay, goes. The horse is starting to dance a little bit because he knows what's going on, so I talk to him a little bit. Pat him, it's okay, Gray, you know, we'll be out there in a minute. Are they calling me? Five, four, three, two, one, go! This is the second day of the Lexington, Kentucky three day competition. Five, four, three, two, one, go! The first day was a dressage test. The third day will be a show jumping test both of medium difficulty. But this is Endurance Day, and it's the most difficult. It's divided into four phases. This is phase B, the steeplechase, a two-mile course with 10 obstacles. For the best score, it must not only be ridden cleanly. Five, four, three, two, one, go but at a very fast 26 miles per hour. Before this comes phase A, six miles of roads and tracks. After this steeplechase, riders will go on to phase C, another nine miles. In these first three phases, riders make every effort to conserve their horse's strength. The danger is so great that after phase C, the rules require the horse be given a rest. I hear him. Walk him. 
you have about 14 minutes till you start, I'll give you three minute warning. You go out at 50. Vets and show officials check the horse to see if he's fit to continue. Heart rate 90. They check temperature, pulse, respiration. 80. I mean, just walk him for a little minute. Grooms keep the horse moving so that he will not stiffen up or get chilled. Let me see him, Pam. Pause a minute. Just keep him walking. Good boy, Grey Goose. Mike Blum has a hard time leaving his horse to the care of his assistants. His grooms say that he cannot overcome the urge to do everything himself. I wouldn't, I'd put a cooler on him and a, uh, I mean, a string sheet. Well, this one's in jogging. Uh, we watched him jog as he came in. Do you want me to pull that other one off? No. You know, in the locker room, they, they put on the band music and they get you all stirred up. And uh, here, you've got to pretty much do it yourself. You've got, you've got phase A and phase B and phase C to kind of get you ready. But the cross country is the meat. And uh, that's where you have to go out of there on fire. On fire, but thinking. Just before I get on the horse, just before the cross country phase itself, I'm watching the horse. I want to see what vibrations do I get off it. What kind of look does he have in his eye? Does he look as if he has a little hot coal buried in there, glowing with fire? I don't care if he's sweating or dry. I want to know what his spiritual qualities are. Because this, is a, this event is a crucible. And if it is done properly, it burns away everything that is false and unreal about your training. And it reveals what was correct and pure and proper in how you prepared that horse. Three, two, one, go. Torrance begins phase D. It's only about five miles long. But within that five miles, there are 25 fixed obstacles, each in its own way extremely difficult and challenging. And horse and rider must maintain an average speed of 21 miles per hour. It's one of the most grueling tests in equestrian sport. Originally a cavalry test, it was meant to simulate battlefield conditions. We might have three or four fences in a row. And what will make the fence ride well the fence, when I say the fence, I mean the whole combination ride well, is whether the rider can be so accurate through the combination. The combination will not be easy. And whether he can adjust his speed for that particular type of combination and keep the speed and not be able to let his eye waver one way or the other because the minute he does, his horse will follow his eye and go off. You've got to be very quick. You've got to think in the air. When the horse leaves the ground, you've got to say, oh, I'm wrong. It sounds like it happens in slow motion. It happens in split seconds. Jim Wofford. Torrance Watkins approaches the sinkhole. Here the horse must jump down into a dark ditch. Turn sharply, then jump back out again. You've got to find out where the rough fences are, the, the fences that have caused trouble. You may have to change your route to a couple of jumps because of bad footing or because of the fact that you have read the course wrong when you walked it. Uh, it's very easy to be overconfident, to back off and let your guard off. That's dangerous. Uh, you've got to 
consider and ride each jump. There are no gifts. Everybody feels it's not going to happen to them. They're not going to wreck. We know it's going to happen eventually, but when we go out there, we don't believe it is. Last year, I had a misfortune here where I jumped up on the bank very aggressively. He hooked it, and it was just like you hung us up by a meat hook. And I knew at that moment, you know, it was good night, Irene. And I sort of sat up, fed in the reins, because we are, unfortunately, in some ways, I never try to bail out. I always, you know, wait, I'm always waiting for the miracle. You know, I don't want the 60 penalty, so I'm going to ride that guy until he buries me. And, you know, I was sort of up there, you know, thinking at the brief moment, you know, come on, God, show me a miracle. And the miracle he showed me was that I could survive the wreck. No, I've never felt the fear. Never. Beforehand, yes, you get a little bit afraid. You think about it a little bit, but then you say, I got to put that out of my mind, because if you ride with the fear, something's going to happen. If you go out there with that in your mind, then you're probably riding for a fall. Jim Wofford approaches the water jump. These are especially unnerving for the horse. Go on. Go on. Because he can't judge the depth of the water. survival out there you know it's keeping that horse between you and the ground when things are going bad or when the horse makes a mistake The worst accidents occur when the horse falls on the rider. Negative. Run over there and personally contact KSP, Kentucky State Police at Divine Sam. We'll need an escort off post. Over. Karen Stives' heart stopped. Negative. All the way. Come on, we'll get him. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation was administered. Karen revived and was brought to a nearby hospital to be treated for a severe concussion. Amazingly, she was back riding again within a month. Come 
right through there. May I dismount, please? Go ahead. You've got blood all over your face, haven't you? I'll take the race saddle down for her. I, I guess I had it coming to me because he, he slipped a little bit all the way around, but he slipped there and he just hooked it. And I almost stayed on, but I know I couldn't you grabbed him on the neck I and her hung in there as long as I could. Well, I think the good thing about it is that he hurt himself pretty good. So here. he failed it, yeah. And I almost pulled him up, but I thought, Jesus, let's see how tough he is. And he went down to that water and jumped right in, and that's a stopper. Yeah. Torrance Watkins at the Lexington Bank. It's a marvelous thing because you and the horse become one being. You're out there on cross country and the fences come up fast. The horse has never seen them. He knows that I'll never put him in a bad place. It may look like it's impossible to get through there, but he knows that if I say, you can do it there, Gray, do it this way, then he'll do it. He absolutely trusts me. Marvelous feeling. Jim Wofford finished the course with a good time. Did I hear them call me for a refusal someplace, or was that somebody else while I was going? They called you, and then they corrected it. Right. I guess one of the magical parts of the sport is being able to go out there, and it, it's like uh, climbing Everest. It's there, you're going to do it, you know you're going to face elements, you know you're going to face dangers that normal people <laughs> wouldn't do, but it's something you have to do. Torrance and her horse Southern Comfort cleared all the jumps without a fall or refusal. Lovely course. <laughs> yes, Had a wonderful time. Okay. I'm afraid it's clean and very fast. It's almost out of this world. It's something nobody can bring you down because you've just accomplished something between you and your horse and a course that was supposed to be bigger than you and bigger and a course that is um, can easily pull you out of the sky and land you on the ground hard. Um, the feeling, having done it right, is obviously a feeling of tremendous accomplishment, tremendous pride in the horse and yourself. But then there's that feeling that is very personal to me, and I really can't describe it. It's like being in an airplane and looking at it, soft, fluffy, pink thunderheads. You know, it's can't describe it. Not only did Kim Walness and the Grey Goose jump every fence cleanly, they also rode the four phases without a time fault. It was a nearly perfect ride. Permission to dismount? Okay. Thank you. Can I get him as close as possible? We'll help you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. What you a need breast plate, Good boy. Oh, what a heart. What a... Oh, good boy. Oh, good boy. Oh, good boy. You are a star. What a star. Walking. Uh, uh, Kim, uh, I'm Nonnie Rich, and I have to ask you a few questions. Of course, obviously, you just thought it was wonderful. Yeah. Oh, it's marvelous. <laughs> you come away from that so excited and so ecstatic, and it takes you the whole rest of the day to come down. You just talk to anybody you can find about it. It's just marvelous. Great. Thank you. Woo-hoo! <laughs> And the winner of the Gladstone Trophy here at 1982 Kentucky three-day event, number 14, 
The Grey Goose, written by Kim Walnut, a score of 46.6. Lexington, Tampa, and Gladstone were the climaxes of a series of competitions to choose the next United States equestrian teams in show jumping, dressage, three-day eventing. A moment of triumph before these new teams face the challenge of competition abroad and feel the pride of riding for America. I think that uh, if you're lucky enough to represent your country abroad and to win an important competition and stand and see your flag raised and hear your anthem played, you would be quite unrealistic if you didn't at the same time count your blessings and think about all the people who helped make that possible for you. Because you can't do it alone. You just happen to be the lucky one. You happen to be in the place where lightning struck but only because thousands of other people, through their contributions, whether as riders or as grooms or as supporters of the team, made it possible for you to be there, and in that way, for your country to be there. <laughs>